The interstate highway system, moving millions of Americans and billions of dollars worth of goods and services on a daily basis. When you see that blue shield and you enter that ramp, you know it's time to hit the gas because it's going to be a certain standard of driving. Interstate standard. But what are interstate standards? What does it mean when a roadway gets that coveted blue shield? We hear a lot about what are and what aren't interstate standards and which roads meet that golden standard. However, there is a bit of confusion around what exactly those standards are. On this video, we'll be taking a look at what interstate standards are directly from the source. And I'll be breaking it down to clear up some myths and common misperceptions about what the standards are. Go ahead, like the video, subscribe if you love this type of content, and let's talk about some interstates. First, let's talk about the origins of interstate standards. Interstate standards were originally defined with the 1956 Federal Highway Act, which called for a uniform standard of geometric and construction standards for the future interstate highway system. You see, prior to the interstate highway system, the U.S. had the United States numbered highway system, which still exists today as denoted by these types of shields. Though this highway system was national, the standards varied widely around different states and localities. There was no minimum standard, so a U.S. highway could vary widely in design from a surface street through a downtown to a winding, dangerous two-lane mountain route all the way up to a full, controlled access freeway. With this wild variance in roadway quality, moving goods and people across the U.S. prior to the interstate highway system was quite the task. I doubt we see the two-day or same-day Amazon Prime deliveries or that near-instant restocking of store shelves that we have today if we still relied on the U.S. numbered highway system. The interstate highway system established a minimum design standard to where motorists can expect to move more safely and at higher speeds, among other things. For the word of law on interstate standards, we look to an organization called AASHTO, which stands for American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. These standards are defined in a lengthy document called the Green Book. The interstate standards of today are higher than the original standards of 1956, most recently having been revised in 2016. So on this video, we'll be discussing that modern standard. But first, the purpose of the interstate highway system as defined by AASHTO states that the interstate highway system is designed to safely and efficiently accommodate the volume of passenger vehicles, buses, trucks, including tractor trailer and semi-trailer combinations and corresponding military equipment estimated for the design year. The design year for new construction and reconstruction should be at least 20 years beyond the year in which the plans, specifications, and estimate from construction of the section are approved. So in other words, interstate highways are required to be able to handle all types of vehicles. You'll notice that in places like New York City, you will see parkways that are not interstates, despite being limited access as these roadways were not designed to accommodate larger vehicles. Also note the 20 year design requirement. This means that when a highway is designed to become an interstate, it must meet the needs of the 20 year projections and traffic, not the current year for which it is being designed. The next requirement is right of way. The width of right of way shall be sufficient to accommodate the roadway cross section elements and requisite opportunities necessary for an adequate facility in the design year. Acquisition of right of way sufficient to accommodate anticipated future improvements should be considered. This means that when acquiring right-of-way for an interstate, the right-of-way must be wide enough to hold the required lanes, shoulders, and such, and, if possible, also the right-of-way for potential redesign or expansion later on, if necessary. The next standard is one that for the most part everyone is familiar with, access control. Access to the interstate system, including ramps, shall be fully controlled. The interstate highways shall be grade separated at all railroad crossings and selected public crossroads. At grade intersections shall not be allowed. To accomplish this, all intersecting roads are to be grade separated, terminated, rerouted, and or intercepted by frontage roads. Access is to be achieved by interchanges at select public roads. This means that no other road or railroad can cross the interstate highways travel lanes directly. Only access through ramps is allowed. This also means that interstate ramps are subject to this requirement and are not to be crossed by other roads or railroads if they provide access to the interstate lanes. The next standard is the design speed. A table provided here we can see in both miles per hour and kilometers per hour. In rural non-mountainous areas, the design speed is 70 miles per hour, while in mountainous areas it is 50 miles per hour. In urban areas, interstates can be designed for 50 miles per hour. Note that the design speed isn't necessarily what you will see as the posted speed limit, as engineers will usually design the actual highway for safe operation 
at a slightly higher speed than the posted speed limits. And now the one you've all been waiting for, the number of lanes. How many lanes must an interstate highway have? Interstate highways shall have a minimum of two through traffic lanes for each direction of travel. For new location projects, the number of lanes provided shall be sufficient to demonstrate an acceptable operation condition associated with the anticipated DHV in the design year. Projects in existing corridors shall provide enough lanes to demonstrate that the facility will operate as well or better than the no build condition in that design year. While I'm sure that everyone was aware of the two lane requirement, what might be new information is the rest of the lane requirements. What this means is that when a new interstate is built, it must be built with enough lanes to maintain acceptable conditions for the 20 year DHV requirement. In non-engineered translation, this means that states can't build a two lane interstate if projections show that it would be immediately or quickly overwhelmed to be in poor service condition shortly after opening. And the section regarding existing corridors means that a proposed interstate must demonstrate that it will provide superior service over leaving the corridor as is and not building the interstate at all. On the lane width requirement, it is 12 feet or 3.6 meters for my non-American viewers. And that one is pretty self-explanatory. Shoulder width is one place where I have seen a bit of confusion. Contrary to popular belief, there is not a universal shoulder width requirement for interstates, but rather it varies depending on the number of travel lanes and the terrain. As we can see in the chart here, a two lane interstate on level or rolling terrain requires a four foot left shoulder and a 10 foot right shoulder. If the highway has three lanes or more, then both shoulders must be at least 10 feet. For mountainous highways of two to three lanes, the left shoulder is four feet and the right shoulder is eight feet. If the mountainous interstate has four or more lanes, then both shoulders must be eight feet wide. Now as for the medians, in rural or rolling topography, the medians must be at least 50 feet wide, but 60 feet is preferred. In urban areas, the median is required to be wide enough to accommodate the left shoulder as well as a barrier. When it comes to curbs, Ashto states that caution should be used against curbs on interstates. Where curbs are provided, they shall not be closer to the traveled way than the outer edge of the paved shoulder, and they shall have a sloping face and shall be limited to a height of four inches. In urban and suburban areas, consideration should be given to providing bicycle and pedestrian accommodation along the crossroad or reserving sufficient space for such facilities to be added in the future. So basically this means that in developed areas, roads crossing over or under interstates should have accommodations for bicycles and or pedestrians, or at least have space for these things. Next up are the bridge requirements for interstates. Bridges of less than 200 feet in length must carry the full roadway to include the paved shoulders, while longer bridges only require the bridge to be four feet minimum. So this means that those short bridges you might see over a small creek or low-lying area basically have to meet the same requirements of the full roadway, while those bigger, longer bridges over large rivers or other features can have smaller shoulders. Now you've probably seen some bridges that don't meet these standards but still have an interstate designation. For already existing bridges, if the lanes are at least 12 feet and the left shoulder is at least 3.5 feet and the right shoulder is at least 10 feet, then they can be added to the interstate highway system. And for a longer existing bridge, a shoulder of only 3.5 feet is required on both sides. So now that we know what the standards are, what about some of those exceptions that violate the rules? I'm sure some of you are familiar with these, so let's talk about a few of them. The first one is the Mackinac Bridge in Michigan. The Mackinac carries I-75 and connects the upper peninsula of Michigan with the main lower peninsula. The bridge has a four lane undivided configuration in violation of interstate standards, but was grandfathered into the system because it was built prior to the system. Another exception to the rule is I-78 in Jersey City, New Jersey. I went to this area back in the fall of 2022, and to my surprise, there it was. Traffic lights on an interstate. I-78 becomes a surface street, 12th and 14th streets in Jersey City, right before entering the Holland Tunnel. This exception was likely made due to the difficulty of right-of-way acquisition for an interchange before the tunnel. Another exception nearby is in the city of Philadelphia, where we have Interstate 676. Interstate 676 enters Philadelphia via the Ben Franklin Bridge from New Jersey, which itself is not up to interstate highway standards either. And once you reach the city, you are greeted by a signalized intersection before joining the Vine Street Expressway, where it continues as a freeway. The reason this exception is this was to protect the historically sensitive areas that were in the path of the interstate, mainly Franklin Square. Also in Pennsylvania is perhaps the biggest and most well-known violation of interstate standards, 
and that is I-70 in Breezewood. In Breezewood, I-70 does not have a direct interchange with the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Instead, drivers must use US-30 and drive through several traffic signals in order to get to or from the Turnpike from Interstate 70. The Breezewood situation exists because the state did not qualify for federal funds to build an interchange with I-70 unless they agreed to stop collecting toll revenue after the bonds expired due to such an interchange forcing drivers into the toll turnpike with no free alternative. And state officials were already afraid of losing toll revenue with the free Interstate 80 being built through the state. The current setup allowed the state to still use federal funds to build this interchange. Now the rules on funding have changed today, but many local businesses have lobbied against building a direct interchange with I-70 as they fear a loss of revenue if drivers are no longer forced to stop in Breezewood. So today, Breezewood is known as a sort of tourist trap for those forced to stop there on their travels through Pennsylvania. Interstate 40 is another interstate with known violations in both Texas and North Carolina. In Texas, great intersections with medium brakes with local roads can be found for access by cattle ranches. Similarly, in western North Carolina, there are a few dirt roads which directly intersect with I-40. In both of these cases, the great intersections likely exist due to the financial unfeasibility of constructing interchanges with such lightly traveled roads, but still giving the locals access to the interstate. And these are just a few examples. There are many more violations, so maybe we'll do a full video on interstate violations in the future. But there it is, guys, the gold standard for highways, interstate highway standards. Those are all the things required to get that blue shield. Have you encountered any interstate violations? Or do you know of any roads that you think meet the standard, but don't actually have the blue shield? Let me know what you think in the comments, and I will see you on the next one.